Um, but yeah, so uh, uh, I'm Matthew from uh, Campaigns Against the Arms Trade, which I hope you've all heard about. If you haven't, we pretty much uh, do what it says on the tin. Uh, and I'm here to speak about our project Army on All Sides, um, which we, um, we, we created, uh, we came up with the idea of, with this project about a year ago, um, with the idea of uh, Opposing the glorification of World War One and, and the anniversary, um, and this project was, uh, was started by us and it was supported by On the Record, which is a brilliant co-op which aims to uh, expose the hidden parts of history. Um, and so I guess we wanted to look specifically at how the arms trade worked during World War One. Uh, obviously, we have quite a lot of expertise on how the arms trade works now. Uh, we campaign against it, but we didn't know much about World War One, uh, how how it worked, and who campaigned against the arms trade during during the war. Um, and so that was basically the start of the project, and we had uh, well, quite a few volunteers who did some brilliant research throughout the country in libraries and archives, um, looking for information uh, related to the project, and we put together about. 25 different case studies, put them together on our website, Arm in All Sides. Uh, and each of these case studies, they look at different aspects of the arms trade. So the, the making, the production, the selling, uh, the policies of the government at the time, uh, opposition. So kind of, and we don't just focus on, on World War One in, in, on the website, we kind of look at before and after. Uh, so time, Time is tight today, so I'm just going to focus on specifically on how the armed companies behave, and I'm going to talk a bit about um, resistance, um, and then I'm going to. I think Annie, Annie, yeah. Annie you're going to speak a bit about what's happening in Bristol. Uh, so I'm going to begin with the Royal, Tra Royal Arms Commission, uh, give you a brief overview of uh, the most interesting case studies, and then kind of look at the modern day parallels because the aim of this project is not just to look at the historical context of the arms trade but also we want to draw the parallels with today and kind of expose how little has changed in 100 years so these case studies want to be a, they want to be a, a reminder for activists um, today and um, so like I said I'm not gonna start with 1914 or indeed any of the years in during which World War One was fought, but I'm going to start with the Royal Commission against the private arms trade, um, which happened in 1935. Has anyone ever heard of this? No, um, and I I'd never heard of this before the project. Um, and obviously, the Royal Commission is a is an inquiry, a public inquiry, which is uh, set up on a certain issue, and it was commissioned by uh, the Prime Minister at the time, Macdonald to look at, at, at the private manufacture of, of, of arms and trading uh, and to decide if it should be banned or not. So this is, it was really important at the time because I think this is the closest that Britain ever got to actually banning the private arms trade. Um, and it's one of those pages of history which has been forgotten. I mean, I didn't know about it, uh, just found out uh, throughout our project. Um, and it lasted about one year, it had 22 public hearings, and we know that it received tons, tons of evidence, I mean, about two million people sent in evidence, um, mostly from uh, pro, pro disarmament side. So it listened first to pro disarmament evidence, and then it listened to, um, it gained evidence from the heads of the private arms companies, and then it listened to government departments in private. Um, so what I would like to do now is kind of have a mock trial uh, where, we, where you can either get to play an arms dealer or a communist leader. Um, I don't know, do we have any volunteers? <laughs> all you've got to do is read out a quote. Yeah, that's all you have to do. Like scary. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll be the commissioner. Yeah. But, yeah, come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. excellent. Yeah. Okay, let's have some communist leaders to the front. We'd like three volunteers to be radical leaders, uh, radical disarmament campaigners. So three people wanted to... Go ahead, John. Go on. Go on. All right, go on. 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 Go on.
Uh, Should we have one more one there? From the back. Do you want to come up? Crack in. You want to be a communist? Okay. And then we need three people to volunteer to be dastardly arms dealers. You've got the best quotes. So we're going to give you a slip of paper with a quote. Is that an arms dealer arm at the front? Do you want to come over this side with me? Um, Anyone else fancy being an arms dealer? Yeah, we've got one there, so we need one more. Always put the lights on. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, the lights on might be a good idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe lights on for a sec so if you can have a quick look at their quotes. Uh, who is our last arms dealer? I've got two arms. Yeah, yeah. Arms yeah. 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 Right. yeah. yeah. Looks at the same. I think yeah. we've, no, we've actually got everyone. We're missing a. Are we missing a We're missing a design. Okay. So. So how, how many how many arms dealers do you need? We've got we've got three arms dealers. Okay. Um, we've only got okay. two design ones. Oh okay, so someone's off the hook. Who is yeah. our who is our least enthusiast? <laughs> we could be the commissioner. Do you want to join Matt and yeah, be the commissioner and you can call on people to hear the evidence? Because I think we've got uh, we need two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's more than one, so you want to come over here. You sure? Yeah. Crack in, okay. So if everyone that's got a crate could just like have a little look at your crate and be prepared to, to read it out when our commissioner calls upon you to give your piece of evidence. Yeah, so like I said, um, the prosecution that were aimed at wanted to ban the private arms rate mm -hmm. went first. Uh, and really there was a broad range of perspectives that came into play. Um, so on the left here we have uh, Lloyd George who was Prime Minister at the time of World War I. Um, what did he have to say about? Does anyone have Lloyd George here, by the way? I think he's probably the one that's missing. Is he our missing uh, one? He's our missing one. Okay. But he basically he argued that uh, private arms companies could not be trusted during war times, and so he argued basically for the state to be the sole supplier of arms to it. So quite a conservative argument, uh, as opposed to Harry Pollis, who was leader of the Communist Party at the time. Uh, Harry, what? Well, yeah. What, what do you think about arms trade? Harry Pollitt spoke for the Communist Party using a wealth of statistical data to back up his argument. His figures, mostly from the League of Nations, showed that Britain was the largest contributor to the international arms trade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he also revealed which capitalists sat on arms firms' boards. Those he named controversially included the chairman of the Royal Commission, Sir John Eldon Banker. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, we'll say no more on that. <laughs> <laughs> and here on the right, we have uh, Sir William Jowett, who was leader of the Union for Democratic Control, which was an anti militarist party during, during the war. Um, yes. Sir William, yeah. what do you have to say? Um, well, we've got major concerns that aircraft and also war chemicals that could be used in explosives are exempt from export licensing. The manufacture of armaments could then be completed overseas, for instance, guns were fitted onto commercial aircraft after being exported. This aberration can be averted only through a blanket ban of arms exports. Okay, so quite a radical like, position compared to like, George, like, complete ban. So I think that's it uh, from the prosecution. Thank you to the prosecution. Thank you. We're now going to pass on to the defence. Um, so obviously, heads of the arms companies were called to give uh, test evidence. And on the, we had uh, three representatives from Vickers, who was the biggest arms company at the time, um, which is now, which then became what we know now as BAE. Uh, and on the left, we have uh, the head of Vickers, Sir Herbert Lawrence. <laughs> Uh, do we have a Herbert here? Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> what, do you, what do you have to say on the private okay. arms trade? Because Herbert Lawrence said that the prosecution held a pacifist prejudice, an honourable but perhaps mistaken ideal respecting the sanctity of life. When asked, to, I carry on? Yeah. when asked about this strange statement, later they explained, I think the sanctity of human life has sometimes been exaggerated altogether to the disadvantage of certain other features of human life. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't very convincing. Quite, quite astonishing. Uh, but we have somebody else from Vickers who maybe can yeah, give, give us something a bit more objective. Like, What do you have to say? Uh, Craven claimed that Vickers products were no more dangerous than any other kind. He flippantly gave an example. 
He had never been injured by a gun, but once nearly lost an eye with a Christmas cracker. <laughs> <laughs> So that's the strongest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and last but not least, we have uh, Paddy McGowan, who is uh, the head of Imperial Chemical Industries. Uh, so, Paddy, I think you've been implicated. You, you, you've been selling uh, chemicals to both China and Japan? Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> why not? Well, what can I say? Um, I have no objection to selling to both sides. I'm not a purist in these things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you to our other <laughs> So yeah, these were all quotes that we found like they're true, and obviously they were quite astonishing. And we know that at least one of the commissioners was convinced of how evil the arms trade was, uh, thanks to this evidence. Um, and, 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 in, and ultimately, the commission recommended uh, for the state to become the sole supply. For, so they recommended. The, 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 the arms trade to become nationalised and they also recommended an export ban. Now I'm not going to tell you about the outcome right now, I'm going to tell you that at the end, uh, you, you, you understand why, you can imagine what it was. Um, but um, I think what is, what's important to the Allies is how we came to this commission. Uh, like I said, two million people sent evidence to the commission for disarmament. I think this is indicative of the public sentiment against the private trade companies. I think this is mainly due to how the companies behaved before and during the war. Um, and so here I've listed six uh, points, six characteristics um, that the arms trade became synonymous with and which are still, which are, which are still true today. Uh, and so while I, I'm going to give you a whistle stop tour some case studies that refer back to these. And what I want you to do when I do this is think of modern day parallels, like can, what, 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 what is still the same? What, is, what has changed? What has not changed? Um, so I'm going to start talking about who were the arms companies before World War I. So we know, I mean, it's, it's acknowledged that uh, World War I was caused by the massive arms that embraced Europe for two decades before the war started. Um, and here we have a slide from uh, 1913 that shows how much Britain was spending on, on the military, um, so more than 50%. Uh, um, this was just one year before the war started, despite uh, the Liberal government being elected on a, on a social welfare spending platform. Um, but who were the arms companies? Uh, so this slide shows you Armaments Octopus, um, it's also from 1913 if I'm correct. Um, so what, if you can't see, uh, what you have on the outer side of the circle is the different countries. So we have Great Britain, the States, Germany, Japan, France. Uh, each of these have, have their own companies but they're, they're all in, interlinked. Uh, so it's a truly global business. Uh, and the, the biggest arms companies in Britain at the time were Vickers, Armstrong and uh, Coventry Ordnance Works. Uh, but Vickers Armstrong, they, they uh, uh, cover, I think, nearly 70% of the whole markets in Britain. So they were the two leaders at the time. So it was a truly global industry. And in fact, what they did, a lot of companies, was they merged with each other in uh, international armament rings uh, in order to uh, fight off competition and to raise profits. Uh, and one of the most well-known armament rings was the Nobel, Nobel Dynamite Trust, which was started by Alfred Nobel, which of course, who of course gave his name to the Peace Nobel Prize, but it was also shelled and advisors to 14 dynamite companies. And he created at the end of the 19th century the Nobel Dynamite Trust, which was effectively the first multinational uh, business venture. Uh, it, was, it was huge. Uh, and it had its main office was based in Glasgow, um, but it had it, it covered companies from all across the world, but mainly from Germany and England. So I think um, it, it's, it's 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 yeah panel of directors was equally shared with, with Germany and England. So when the war started in 1914, you would imagine that their their profit would would have been 
limited because of this German British settlement. And in 1914, the government passed the Trading with the Enemy Act, which banned companies from exporting to uh, countries with an enemy nature. But we know that until 1916, this wasn't the case. Uh, it took up to 1916 for the two, for the British and German uh, arms of, of the company to separate. Um, and we now also know that they, um, the, the a British and German um, shareholder, they actually met in person uh, during when I think in 1916 to exchange cash. At the same time that the government was banning peace activists from uh, traveling to the aid for the International Women Peace Conference. Um, so yeah, double standards here. Uh, and the Nobel Dynamite Trust at the time claimed that it was acting in the national interest and so its dividends were tax-free. So it made huge, huge profits and it's, and because for two years at least it, it didn't really have, uh, it wasn't really stopped by the government in any way, we can, we can assume that German shareholders were making profit from German deaths and equally British shareholders were making profit from the death of British soldiers. And so this is just an example of how these global companies were selling to all sides to anyone who had the money with no uh, um, concern for, for the country. Uh, and another example um, that shows you, that exposes the selling to all sides element is the Turkish Navy scandal. So in, in 1908, after the Young Turks Revolution uh, in, in Turkey, uh, the Ottoman Empire wanted to um, renovate its naval force and so consequently England and Germany competed to give uh, to, to offer them the best the best deals uh, and England came came on top because uh, Vickers signed a massive contract uh, to sell uh, naval uh, naval armaments and battleships to them and while the the British government said that they they, they weren't given direct support uh, we know that they did give assistance uh, as a way to counterbalance Germany's influence um, and so I think in 1914 80% of experts that were going from Britain to the Ottoman Empire were armament um, but and this is this is actually one of the ships that we uh, that Britain produced for, for the Ottoman Empire and in uh, 1914 in the summer of 1914 uh, 500 Turkish troops came to Newcastle in order to board on it but Churchill decided that this uh, this deal was didn't have, wasn't going to go through uh, and that this ship belonged to the British army and, and so the Ottoman Empire was so offended that um, eventually they, they moved towards the influence of the, of the Germans and so this was the Turkish uh, scandal but again this is a photo from uh, Gallipoli where 230,000 Allied troops died including French uh, British and Australian troops. It is safe to assume that most of them died because of British weapons, because we'd given so many to to the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> so again, this shows you how companies were selling to anyone, regardless of who. Uh, and I think an emblematic figure of the time was Basil Zahov, who uh, worked for Vickers. He also worked for the government, and he was known at the time as as a merchant of death. Um, he was one of the richest men in, in Europe and he made huge, huge, huge profits during the war and he was uh, again like selling weapons to anyone and he was actually, he became a character in uh, one of uh, the Tintin comics uh, as, as again somebody who creates a conflict uh, in order to sell to both sides so he's yeah, this emblematic figure of the time so I've talked a bit about the selling to all sides uh, which gives the name to the product. Uh, but uh, another way that companies, arm companies, make profit is obviously by creating war scares. So I'm going to tell you a bit about that. This is a photo of Coventry Ordnance Works. So I told you the biggest companies at the time were Vickers and Armstrongs. These were private companies. Coventry Ordnance Works was state owned. And it was uh, created in 1908. But it wasn't as strong as Vickers and Armstrongs. Most orders for weapons were going to these two. And so uh, the head of this, uh, the head of commentary was a certain guy called 
Henry Mulliner, and we don't, we, I don't have an image of him, unfortunately, but he was desperate for, in 1906 for orders. Uh, and so what did he do? He, he basically spread the rumor that Germany at the time was secretly uh, arming its, uh, reinforces, it, it, reinforcing its uh, naval force. Um, and so he created this uh, atmosphere of paranoia. And for three years, from 1906 to 1909, he campaigned, the late, he campaigned uh, for, for the British government to put more money in the army, to build more battleships. Uh, and he had the support of uh, the media, uh, the Daily Mail, uh, <laughs> uh, actively supported him. And every day he wrote articles saying Germany is preparing to invade us, uh, we, must, we must intervene, we must uh, uh, build more ships. Uh, and so obviously this kind of campaign <coughs> had a massive influence. And in 1909, Mulliner uh, was able to meet uh, Prime Minister 10 Downing Street. Uh, and uh, which, which led to a parliament debate in which um, yeah, this is just a cartoon of the time that shows you this, the naval scare um, so like I said yeah, in 1909 there was a parliamentary debate uh, and uh, Balfour which uh, you may know for the Balfour Decla Declaration on Palestine in which he, uh, in which he basically promised uh, Palestine to the Jewish people and who was also a shareholder of Coventry Ordnance Works uh, and he was also an MP and during the parliamentary debate he, he urged the government to spend more money because we need, we need to intervene and, um, and inevitably uh, that's what happened massive increase in military expenditure um, even if we know that this was all a scare even Churchill in 1920 after the war said that there was no uh, German um, military um, reinforcement of its naval forces. Um, so again, yeah, this war scare. Oh yeah, this is Mulina on the left, the moustache, uh, playing yeah, battle games, battleship games with other countries. So I've uh, talked a bit about how arm companies behaved in the war. I'm gonna jump to after the war. Uh, because the Amsterdam's made huge profits during the war, because of the war, uh, and after they couldn't, they weren't selling weapons, so they had massive, massive financial problems. We know that uh, in 1926 they were both operating at 40 percent of their capacity, uh, and they had a uh, huge debt towards the government, I think about two million pounds, which was uh, huge at the time. And so in 1926 uh, a committee was formed to look into the issue and the chairman was uh, Churchill uh, pictured, yeah, coming out in the sea here uh, and um, one of the proposals was that uh, the two companies to be merged and to be aided by the state basically a, a bailout, a national bailout and most of the people on the committee and most of the MPs were opposed to this idea uh, and Churchill was the only one who was strongly supportive this proposal um, again he uh, and there was this fear mongering tactic that he used there was this idea that if you didn't have uh, companies producing arms then if England went to war it would um, they would they, it would it would be in a position where it couldn't defend itself but but most most again most of the members of the committee they uh, they, they, they didn't believe in this because uh, they weren't the only companies in the UK. Um, and so what Churchill did, he took advantage of the summer and he didn't want to, when most MPs go on holiday and when Parliament is, is, not, is not open, and, but Churchill didn't want to disturb the committee members during, during this uh, summer holiday. And so he sent a letter to the head of the Bank of England at the time, Montagu, basically telling him uh, <coughs> uh, we need to do the bailout because it's a, it's a matter of national emergency. Even if the Bank of England was, had been aware for years of the financial situation of Victor and Armstrong. And, uh, and so basically, without any kind of public accountability, um, the committee itself was a foregone conclusion. The two companies merged and there was a massive bailout. This is another comic of the time. Shows you the tune we dance to. The money goes round and round in the form of income tax, and it comes out 
the panel. So, um, so yeah, I've I've talked, to, I've given you like a, a really, really brief overview of some of the worst aspects of the arms trade during the during the war. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the resistance, um, and I think it's important to be honest with ourselves. There wasn't a mass resistance to to the war or indeed to the arms trade, um, mainly because of uh, most people were employed in munitions factory um, because of the war and because of government suppression. They they passed the uh, laws which uh, um, banned uh, opposition and people speaking out and. Uh, and they banned trade unions from uh, going on strike. But there was some kind of opposition on, a, on an institutional level, the independent Labour Party, uh, which was formed, which was on the left of the main Labour Party, and which was formed at the end of the 19th century, um, they, they opposed the war. And this is a letter that they uh, published the second week of, of the war in August 1914 where they claim uh, a solidarity with the German, with the German brothers. Um, one of the most eminent leaders of uh, the IRP, the Independent Labour Party, was Fenner Brock. <coughs> he, was also he also formed the No Conscription Fellowship, um, which put together consensus object objectors. And he was, uh, in fact, he was jailed for some time because of his ideas. Um, and he, he, was, he was based in Manchester. Manchester was one of the strongholds of the independent Labour Party. Um, but even bigger stronghold was, was Scotland, which had the most members of, of the ILP. And uh, he actually went to Scotland and he, um, and he talked about how uh, there was a massive uh, divide between the ILP supporters, the English supporters and the Scottish supporters. The English supporters were more anti-militarist while the Scottish supporters were more interested in class war. And this is, this is, but this, this, and, and now I'm going to tell you a bit more about what ha was happening in Scotland, which shows you that actually um, the struggle for class uh, equality and, and, and pro-peace activism went together. Um, so this is a, a picture, uh, I'm sure you've all heard of, uh, well, if you haven't heard of uh, Clydeside, which is a district in Glasgow, um, <laughs> and Glasgow was uh, one of the main hotspots for the munition, uh, for the making of munitions, and uh, was also um, nicknamed Red Clydeside because of its uh, revolutionary uh, nature. I, I think when I think a lot of commentators at the time, when the Russian Revolution happened, uh, they thought that if it was to spread to England, <coughs> Glasgow was where it was going to start. Uh, and there was definitely uh, class class war element to the struggles of, uh, of, uh, of the people, uh, the activists in, in Glasgow. But, um, so especially uh, to, to, to support uh, the struggle against event, event strikes and event <coughs> Um But there was also a strong feminist contingency. This is uh, Helen Crawford, and she was, um, she was part of the suffragettes. Um, but she uh, fell out with uh, Helen Pankhurst because, uh, of course, at the time there was this divide within the suffragettes because a lot of them supported the war, like Helen Pankhurst. And so uh, she um, dismissed them as being too liberal and she um, moved towards the socialists and uh, she became more radical. And, uh, and she, um, she saw the links between uh, the fight against the landlords of Glasgow and the profiteering of the arms companies. Like I said, Glasgow was a hotspot for um, arms trade, arms manufacturing, and so a lot of uh, many workers moved moved in Glasgow to work there. And because there was no um, rent law laws, landlords uh, just increased the rents massively, um, and so the, the 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 cost of life was unsustainable. And so um, she linked the two struggles, um, class war and peace activism. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this is a photo that shows you the event strikes. And so there were massive strikes in 1914 and 1915 in which uh, the munition workers 
laid down their tools and, and joined the, the peace activists. Um, and so yeah, this was just a snapshot of, of what was happening during the war. Obviously, if you go on our website, you can you can find uh, more case studies. But uh, I think it's important to uh, bear in mind that even if there was not mass resistance, there was pockets of, of really strong resistance, which kind of put together different elements of, of struggles. Um, and on our website, we also talk about how that uh, those pockets evolved in the mid-war period, especially in the 1920s, in more general, general calls for disarmament. So we know that uh, there was massive resistance in Wales, there was a peace pilgrimage uh, in Bristol, you had people signing a peace letter, and in 1934 you had a peace ballot in which I think about 5 million people, uh, in which 5 million people took part, um, giving their opinion on why the arms trade was, was barred. Uh, and so there was this uh, general public sentiment, which was really strong at the time, and which I think built the momentum for the Commission, which we talked about at the beginning, to, 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 to actually uh, be started in the first place. Now, <coughs> now, I told you what the Commission recommended um, for the arms, for, for a blanket ban on, on arms exports to be put in place and for the state to be the sole manufacturer. Um, but unfortunately, these recommendations n uh, were never put in practice, mainly thanks to this man, uh, uh, <coughs> Anki, who was uh, Secretary of the State at the time. He was a staunch militarist, and he believed that disarmament would uh, damage the national virility of, of Britain. Uh, and he had to uh, present the recommendations to the government, and he, he censored them. Uh, effectively, and he was also helped by history because in 1936 Hitler started moving uh, his, his troops, and the government published a white paper uh, promoting uh, the armament. Uh, and so, basically, these recommendations were never the outcome was 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 was, was, was that there was uh, there was no positive outcome, and I think that's pretty much why when I think of what was happening in World War One and what is happening now, I don't see any difference at all. Uh, and the, the Commission, the commission could, have, could have put a change to that, but it didn't. Um, so these were the six points, uh, was it five? Yeah, five points, which I talked about at the beginning. Um, I don't know if any of you have thought about any modern day parallels. Which you, did anyone did, did any 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 current examples came up to mind, which made you think, oh, not much has changed. So certainly the revolving door policy. <coughs> I, excuse me. <coughs> um, but, uh, we private army, and um, there are always sat examples of people leaving the MOD, sorry, and going then to work for arms manufacturers yeah. or lobbying for them, and I think there's one instance this week. Um, Lord Strathclyde, who's already lobbying, although he's actually within the period in which he's not supposed to be lobbying. You know, so they quite openly break the rules because the rules don't apply to them, or the rules are not applied to them. Yeah, yeah, and definitely. Just one example. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, thinking about that, I mean, the, the, the um, yeah, and, and that's pretty much what was happening when one we saw that mm. politicians were working with arms uh, dealers and. Uh, and it was so common that it didn't really it wasn't seen as corruption. And I think yeah, it's pretty much the same. I mean, the father, the ambassador for Saudi Arabia, uh, he's now he now works for BAE, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. So and we we see examples of that on a daily basis. Um, but certainly, I mean, the arm in all side aspect. I mean, one of the most recent examples was Libya. Uh, Tony Blair sold weapons to Gaddafi. Um, then uh, we. Um, we, we bombed Gaddafi with the same weapons and we sold them to Qatar. Qatar gave them to the rebels. So all conflicts, all, all sides were... It's were quite an interesting weapons. story about that, is that when, when, the, when, the war, when the civil war broke out in Libya, it, I think it was a billion euros worth of, um, of grounds where missiles had been so, so, sold to Libya. And the last shipments were, were just going off 
from Europe into Libya, and so they, yeah. they decided to withhold them yeah, yeah, yeah. Like at the last minute. And like, so they, they'd send everything, and there's one of those last little few missiles. They just went, oh, we won't send them. Yeah. Mm. Got, so. I mean, it, and it's not, it's not like a unique event. I mean, I think last year documents came out which showed that we were selling weapons to uh, Argentina like days before the fall yeah. war. So, I mean, it, it's, it's happening like every day, or Ukraine as well, like we, we've given weapons to Russia and Ukraine. Um, see, I have different examples. Um, but yeah, I mean, we know that the answer it is a global industry, we have massive arms squares. Uh, I mean, we've got the, one of the biggest in London every two years. Um, the government supporting corruption. Um, we know that Tony Blair in 2006, he um, effectively um, put a stop to, the, to, 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 a, to an investigation into the BA corruption scandal in Saudi Arabia. Um, and really, like, I mean, if you go on the website, we, we make the parallels much more evident, like the, 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 what was happening there and now. Um, but yeah, I, I think, yeah, not much has changed. I think, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the campaign that we do is, is kind of the action of the end. It is negative, like, oh, stop selling weapons uh, to corrupt the genes. Uh, this is bad. And I think that's why I'm, I'm really excited because, um, well, I think I've got the slide wrong. But yeah, okay. But basically what we're trying to do uh, is um, have a more positive message and more proactive because um, one of the key arguments that arms companies use nowadays and, and indeed in during World War One is that they're good for the economy, they're good uh, for jobs. I mean how many times have you heard the argument? And yeah, I mean during World War One of course they created loads of jobs, but we know that now that's not true. It's it's a flatline industry. And so uh, we, we want to campaign uh, for and, and loads of money gets put into into those jobs. I mean they're massively subsidized by the government. And so I think it's we really need to campaign for that investment to be to be given to the <coughs> renewable energy sector because uh, that's the sector which is uh, much safer, more sustainable, greener, and there's a massive lack of high skilled engineers, uh, and they're currently working for the arms trade. So we want to, yeah, that's 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 going to be our campaign for the year. Uh, so yeah, really exciting. Um, but yeah, just going back to the World War One aspect. I mean, these are just photos that I took. Uh, a couple of days ago, the West, Westminster Underground Station, there's this massive poster at the entrance celebrating Remembrance Day and, and poppy season, and it's supported by, by Tails, which is uh, one of the biggest arms companies, and they, they produce drones uh, which have been used in the Gaza, Gaza strike. Or here we have uh, Lockheed Martin, an American company, which uh, supports the Poppy Locks Ball. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess it's nothing new, uh, but yeah, companies jumping on the, the poppy pan wagon but it's kind of sad because we know that companies because of, of the World War One stuff. Um, but yeah what I, I guess what, what uh, we can do now is maybe focus more on what's happening in Bristol. Um, mm -hmm. so. So, um, I'm Ali, I'm from Bristol Gates the Arms Trade. So we're a group who meet and again deal with Sermonton, work at Gates the Arms Trade in Bristol, which is huge. We're really in a position of where we've just got loads of massive arms companies right on our doorstep, most of them based up in Filton around UE, around that area where the MOD is. Um, so of course it's a natural place for, um, for arms companies <coughs> to have, have a base. This is the map, I think is this on the CAT website? Yeah, so basically we have a browser where you can post in any postcode of the UK and it will immediately show you uh, what companies there are in the surroundings. So this is just a screenshot of what we have in Bristol. Um, Quite a few companies. Yeah, I think then you can obviously look up the companies. We've also yeah. got on the Bristol Gets the Arms Trade website, which is easiest to find if you just type in Bristol Gets the Arms Trade. It's a WordPress website. Um, there's lots of info on there as well about where the arms companies are based and then in details about some of the arms companies um, as well. So there's plenty of information out there to find out what's happening on our doorstep. Um, 
Yeah. So, uh, um, so we are a group that takes action against the arms trade. Um, we're not proud of the fact that Bristol was built on, um, it's a city of, built on slavery and it's now continuing this dark, um, dark theme but I've really been a city that supports so many of the arms companies. Um, yeah, it sells itself as this really green alternative city and we've got the green capital coming up next year but really behind all that there's still still this going on. So uh, this is um, from an action that was just a couple of weeks ago. Um, Kineticut, a um, big arms company, some of you are nodding, that you must have heard of, um, came, the CEO came to do a uh, speech to Bristol Uni students, sorry, to UE students. Um, and that was part of their distinguished address series they've had, which in the past has welcomed Babcock and BAE Systems, who are both also based in Bristol, massive arms company names. Um, so he was coming along to do this nice talk about graduate positions and things like that at Bristol City Hall, right in the centre of the city, obviously. Um, so we went along and um, handed out flyers, talked to people who were coming into the... Um, <laughs> coming into the <laughs> talk, a uh, bit of a media stunt, got plenty of attention from um, dressing up in um, Grim Reapers and things and um, really drawing attention, really obviously busy just past College Green. Um, we got 40 letters of support signed which we sent off to the council saying that we didn't think that anybody from this sort of business should be renting out using the rooms from our city hall. Um, we then, right at the end, even had George Ferguson came down. Um, he <coughs> heard about the uh, the protest that was happening and came down, um, and we spoke to him about it. He offered his support in spirit. He's well known as a a bit of a uh, tries to sell himself as a green a greenie. Um, and we had a bit of a conversation with him, which we're hoping to take a bit further. We've written him a letter um, asking him to turn that spiritual support into. Um, active support uh, and take that a bit further so we'll keep you posted on that hopefully that will go somewhere and we're looking at thinking about um, getting the council to, to implement some sort of ethical policy about the rooms that they're using in city halls in libraries in museums and things like that that um, not welcoming arms companies into that and really not allowing arms companies to have that uh, public facing trying to you know legitimize themselves and sell themselves as, as soft companies um, to a public face when what they're doing behind um, behind their doors is completely uh, destructive as you all know this is a photo from a protest out in Cardiff so um, last year the um, DPRTE event which is basically a big arms fair uh, well it's it's a procurement event um, with discussions of the big sort of um, up and coming uh, things that are happening <coughs> in the arms trade. And last year it happened at UWE. Um, we held a bit of a uh, demo there. We blocked off uh, some of the gates to UWE, stopping people being able to come in. And we were then handing out flyers and really close uh, up to the people who were actually all coming in, really making them, they doing a walk of shame, talking to them about what was going on in there. and standing against it um, and they didn't come back again this year um, we like to think because of us but they didn't they didn't go far they went down the road to Cardiff so this is uh, a few, uh, yeah a few weeks ago not really three weeks ago um, we went to Cardiff as well and joined activists there um, doing pretty much the same thing and this is them you know we were allowed right up close to them um, sort of naming and shaming and someone great taking photos of everyone going in there and really making it because I think that has a massive impact on the uh, on the organisers of the event that being an embarrassing thing even going in there that's <coughs> really not the sort of uh, welcome you want or the good start to your event um, so we've got the Grim Reapers out there as well I think that's, um, I think that's, that's it the so, um, are they going to come back to Cardiff? We don't know, they don't announce it. I can't remember when they announce where they're going to be Much next. But it's, it's, yeah, it's, only, it's an annual event. So, so if any of you would like to get involved with Bristol Against the Arms Trade, there's a sign-up yeah. sheet yeah. for um, Campaign Against the Arms Trade and then they'll pass those on to us and I can add you to our mailing list for more events that are going on uh, in the city. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was a slide like which I wanted to bring up before, but kind of like talking about 
it's the first of the campaign I was talking about with AMS renewables. I think it's really important that we shift this discourse, you know. AMS companies are not producing jobs, they're not good for the economy, they're not good for the, the security, like what about human security, what about climate change? Uh, and so this campaign is really aiming at shifting that discourse. So we want to get trade unions involved, uh, we want local branches to pass pass motion, promoting the renewable energies and uh, Want to hear more about it? Yeah, sign up. Cool. Uh, do you have any questions about terminal size? I know like, that was a very quick like overview. Like we've got loads of. <coughs> I've got a question. Yeah. So yeah. I used to work for British Aerospace, okay. and um, I've got Phil. And, and one of the things, the first thing to say is, is that there was a large number of people. So just get. I, I was able to avoid working on military projects, and, I, and I've been able to do that for a long time. But for a lot of people, it's very difficult to avoid working on military stuff because you have to say, I'm not doing that. And so I'm interested in like how you tie with trade unions to protect workers who, are, who, will do, who will say, no, I'm not doing that. So for example, I work for British, uh, British Aerospace Commercial Aircraft is a, uh, Division, which is <coughs> producing Airbus aircraft in the end, that's what it's doing. But in order to say, I'm not doing something, um, I mean, I was interviewed at the time because they wanted to put me on the Nimrod, which was like a maritime military aircraft, which, you know, they tried to sell to me as a, as a kind of air sea rescue aircraft, but I you know, carried nuclear depth charges and I'm not full. So, you know, they used to say a lot of things in British Aerospace, but she just read Flight Magazine, it was quite obvious, you know, yeah. they were lying. So, so um, but in order to say that, they asked me why, you know, why I wouldn't work on the project, right? And so I said it was a matter of conscience. And they knew I wasn't a Christian, they knew it was well dodgy. But they said, um, well, what does that mean? So, you know, I had to say, tell them a story, really, which basically, you know, came down to talking about Matrix Church who produced a super gun for, for Saddam Hussein. And um, so I just put forward an argument which said, well, I've got, you know, mates, I play football with other Kurdish kiddies, right, who were gassed at a and uh, by Saddam. And my government decided to sell a weapon of mass destruction to Saddam Hussein. So I don't trust anybody who sells arms, is what I said. Discussion and I was able to get away with it. But I, I was like, I'd been there like probably seven years, right? I was, you know, sort of had a degree, I'm a stress engineer, so a structural engineer. If you was on the shop floor and you were like an apprentice or you knew anybody on the shop floor, it was not the same, right? Yeah. You, you, you didn't have control over where you worked. For example, there were 2,000 workers up at Dynamics and Missiles Division when I started, who were some of the most militant workers in Bristol. I mean, in 1986, those workers occupied the factories. Now, they did, most of the people who started the company, especially if they came from Bristol, didn't have any choice on what they were working on. You just got a job up there, and next thing you know, you could be moved from commercial aircraft, you could be moved into missiles, you could be moved into, like, you know, I don't know, other military projects. So I'm interested in how you link up with trade unions to protect workers, because that's what happens. At some point, you're going to be asked to do it, and you say, I'm not going to do it, and then they go, right, either purposely you're going to have you could be in trouble, especially if you're an agency or contract worker. But another problem is, is that even if you're not, if you're a permanent worker, then you will get, you will fuck your career, basically. Yeah. So, yeah, that's yeah, the question. It's, 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 it's a difficult one. It's a difficult one, but I actually, I think we got an email just a week ago from somebody working for uh, Lord Royce. And he was working, they have a civilian department and then the yeah, military one. And he was basically saying that, I don't want to work here, but, you know, yeah, I've, I've just graduated. This is like the best opportunity. Have and it's uh, it's difficult, but we, and I, I think what we don't want to do with this campaign is alienate those workers by like just saying, "Oh, you're bad, like you're you bastards," like it's because uh, we know that I mean the highly skills, like the highly skilled engineers, we need those skills, but not for the arms trade. And uh, it's a difficult one, but obviously we need to engage with those trade unions that do support workers mm -hmm. in that in that in that sector. Yeah. Uh, um, <coughs> I think probably every meeting I've been to over the last uh, 30 years on the arms trade, people, people have brought up what happened at Lucas Luca, Aerospace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's hard, I don't know whether people realise, no, 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 what happened, but the shop stewards there came up with um, an alternative plan with what to do if they took, could take over the factories and they could produce alternative technologies as opposed to arms. But I mean, I don't think, I mean, Roger would probably agree that, you know, the level of trade union organisation is is at that kind of 
strength now for people to, to, to be able to do that but it's still worth reminding people that that has been you know I've actually got the documents in, in my attic at home of all yeah 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 and it you know they, it was very sophisticated they, they went for the whole factory they worked out exactly what they could do if they could occupy the factory they could then start producing you know useful products so it's still it's still worth Bring, it, it's, it's important that it hasn't been forgotten that you know that you know that, that this was in the what 1970s was it? Yeah, Lucas also, Aerospace. Um, what, uh, who was it? Gave me a pamphlet. Yeah, Jeff Tennant gave me a pamphlet the other day, which is amazing because it's the Bristol version of that plan. Which was actually, what I always laugh because it was done by the late. It, it, it was sponsored by the Labour Party, which tells you what the Labour Party was like in the late 60s. Right, <laughs> like, it was very radical, or at least that. And in that pamphlet, they had their own plan for filter how to turn BAC into like a non-arms producing company. So we, we need to do a meeting on this, but also you need to do, if you know, there's, there's people in Bristol who know all about that stuff. Yeah, and obviously you know, Bristol would be one of the places where the renewable energies, especially offshore wind plants, like But, but what I mean is historically you've got people who know about these this history, history. and it's very yeah. important that Ian said to, to recognise that people were, that, that that is possible, just to know that that was yeah. possible, that people were on that angle in the early 70s. We're really interested to follow up those conversations because certainly like one of the things that we're really hoping to do as like part of the project is to collect case studies of the alternative and certainly like those union fights for let's transfer the skills like let's give people control over their workplace like we'd love to do some interviews with you guys like maybe build up a bit more of a case history of like what was proposed in Bristol. So I think as we saw from the company map, like the arms trade remains very strong in Bristol and yet Bristol like really sells itself as like a green capital. So if we can draw out some of that history of union organising and kind of like bring it to the fore again and kind of like build that possibility, like again that would certainly be like something we'd be really interested in working with you guys. I just want one more thing, so everybody gets an idea that like, and you know, first of all there's two major misconceptions mm -hmm. about engineers and scientists in general. One is that they have control over what's going on, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You're an engineer, you're told you've got to do this, you do it. You don't make the decisions about what's made. Yeah. You, the only decisions we can make is probably how it's made a little bit or kind of what it looks like a little bit, but that's about it. <laughs> and we don't have control over what we've decided. That's done at a much higher level in the company. And the second thing is the misconception that engineers would go out and defend the fact they're building military stuff. Right? Yeah. Most people I know, I mean, we've gone about solar power. And we, the joke in the office used to be when I worked there is I walk around and go, well, yeah, well, wow, that's what it's Time, we should be making solar powered airships. That's what we should be doing. Everyone goes, Yeah, no, if you give a, if you gave that job to the engineers up there, they'd love it. Yeah. They'd love it. <laughs> it's all about government support, it's about capitalism. That's yeah. what it's about. <laughs> Who controls? Yeah. Certainly, like one of the things we're hoping to do with Arms Renewables, like a really strong strand of the lobbying will be like going in at a gov like for that government and management level and saying, Look, the reason that the arms jobs are the ones that are being created at the moment, the reason that's where the apprenticeships are is because all the research and development funding is being pumped into that. So there's one strand of work that we're doing where we're working with engineering students and kind of like supporting them to kind of lobby for like alternative careers fairs, getting arms companies kind of like out of careers fairs and give like empowering them. But we also want to go in at that bigger level and say like, look, these resources need to shift. Like the workers don't want it. The, like the people of England do not want it. Like we're not that interested in building weapons and like it's, it's not working for a safer world. So, yeah, like that's, we'd definitely like really like to speak to you <laughs> about like maybe doing some interviews and a case study around that. Sure, you'll probably have to edit that out. I've <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Take, can you do that take again? <laughs> okay. Are there any other? Ask something. Um, several years ago, I read uh, somewhere that throughout the First World War, uh, British and German uh, chemical companies were trading with each other. Do you know whether that is the uh, case? case I saw your your little map of for the uh, arms mm. companies. There was a link between Britain and Germany. I wonder whether there was a sort of joint uh, uh, company which they set up b b b before the war, which they uh, which they then used to yes, to, to 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 facilitate the, the things. Yeah. I, I know I I can't remember where. It, I read it, but I do remember it struck a stuck in my mind, and I thought that's interesting. Certainly, like um, with chemical companies, and especially with like the production of gas, um, I think there was like a lot of collaboration and like sharing of technology. Um, the Nobel Dynamite Trust, for instance, like is one of those really strong cases where 
like British and German shareholders were investing in dynamite production and kind of sharing the profits of that between them. Um, the armaments, such as, I think one yep. of our arms dealers in the Royal Commission evidence might have been a Yeah, he was, yeah, he was head of the... Yeah, that one there, uh, that is, what is the line from ICI? Is that ICI Farman and ICI, yeah, that yeah. vertical line? Yeah. And so, that denotes they were uh, uh, trading, which are the inner circle, yeah. the smaller mm. uh, boxes there. They're smaller companies in the same countries, are they? Yeah, so these were these would be the German companies. Mm -hmm. yeah. So some this is the imperial chemical, chemical industry. So the lines just mean that they're uh, trading with each other. No, I think they have interest. Like, they have interest. Yeah, in interest. Okay. I guess okay. yeah, shares. Um, but yeah, we listened to evidence from one of the head of the imperial chemical industries, and they were selling to both sides in during the Chinese, uh, the China and Japan. Yeah. In South America okay. as well. So this the th but thing I read, I can't remember what it was. Yeah, it would be interesting to follow that. Specifically so. suggested that the British and German uh, chemical industries were uh, trading with each other throughout the war. So yeah. I don't know. <coughs> uh, my mum used to say that they standardised the ammunition around the time of the First World War, so they could sell ammunition to both sides. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> I don't know if that's true off the top of my head, but I kind of, I hope it is, because it sounds like one of those truisms that like really explain, encapsulates how a situation was working, like just how much collaboration was going on. That was a kind of little urban uh, myth that yeah. I was kidding. I think it says a lot about the way that the companies were interrelated between countries that like, that seems like a credible uh, urban myth, definitely. And the strategy of making things and then having parts added on to them afterwards, that's very, very common now. With, uh, planes, so you can buy, yeah, yeah. so British Aerospace did it in East Timor, didn't it? Well, when they sold to the Indonesians, they, they just produced their, they sold their, said they were trainers for the Hawk jets, weren't they? But then they had a conversion kit to turn into fighter bombers. So similarly, the Swiss, the Swiss sell Pilatus, sell these kind of light, light, what appear to be light aircraft, you know, but are actually like you can buy kits to, to put to put um, you know to allow them to drop napalm or, or, or fire you know or, or fire like rockets. But what was interesting was they were used in Chiapas during the Zapatista uprising in 1994. And one of the strategies that Zapatistas had was to collect all the shell cases and fragments of uh, bombs that were dropped on on uh, villages of, in, 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 uh, in Chiapas, and then they they through their international networks they got people to take them to the factories and. Put Sweden, you know, the, re the remains of the fragmentation bombs and, the, and stuff, and napalm canisters, and then they just confronted people at the factory, with, which is quite a good strategy as well. Yeah, but definitely, like, there's loads of civil companies that will produce stuff that then goes in. Like, I'm, I'm just thinking of like digital components of drones. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's, uh, <coughs> it's like conversion kits, that gets you around the export problem, you know, so you just sell the aircraft as a as a trainer or something, they have mm. yeah, sell the yeah. kits, another company sells the kits and go to a fire exactly. yeah, I think that underlines something about the arms, uh, the arms trade now, which is components really matter. Um, like com components like missile guidance systems and like um, sites and like some of the digital kit is the difference between something being a civilian aircraft and being, being for military use. Um, it's something we see a lot, it comes up quite often um, in like the UK Israeli arms trade which is a very two way trade um, where a lot of what we sell is not necessarily a finished product but it's parts so we sell a lot of like parts for S16s which go to America which are assembled and then go out so it's set like you're absolutely right like it's a really good way for um, to sort of obfuscate about the amount of military support that we're, that we're sending to certain countries. An aircraft these days are broken down into so many mm. components, such massive supply chains, it's really difficult to work out. Mm. Yeah, stuff's coming all over the place. The assembly part is a very small part of the aeroplane, the rest of it mm. is parts everywhere, sub assemblies. And, and I guess like harder for workers that don't want to be involved in that military production because they're not sure where they are in the supply chain and they're not sure how it's going to be used. So it's set like, yeah, it's quite a dodgy practice.
Um, just to add on to that, people who were at the Adam Hotch child, I've got the name right, talked down at the M Shed, which was really brilliant. I mean, I, I talked about the factory in the Midlands that makes the engines to go onto the Israeli drones, which are used to kill the people in Gaza and then can be sold back to this country as battle tested. And he leapt in straight away and said, this isn't just a random who can make what. It's a deliberate strategy. So because he was American, he said, in America, if there's some weapon system, you know, a plane or a rocket or something like that, it is an assembly of lots of parts. The manufacture of those parts might be spread out to every single state throughout North America. So if there was some sort of challenge to that weapon system, perhaps we, don't, you know, we should stop making planes or rockets, whatever they are, every senator would start receiving letters or emails going, ooh, we're going to lose some jobs here. You know? So it actually ties them all <coughs> politically into that project as a backing. And then I realize with Israel and the factory in the Midlands, it also works internationally as well, because Cameron's not going to stand up and go, ooh, those Israelis are bad using those drones to kill people in Gaza. So he's going to get a nudge from the MP from Litchfield going, got a few jobs there, mate, you know. So I don't know what the word is you, you, you know, use for that. Like, it bonds them all together into these, these projects of death, you know. Absolutely. And I think that's why something like that Arms for Renewables campaigning is so important because it kind of gives us a way to kind of speak back to that argument and to say, actually, you know, like, we're not, when we talk about um, disarmament, we're not necessarily talking about job loss. Um, we're talking more about what does it mean to be safe? Like, what does, what what things will keep us safe? Is, is militarisation something that will make us, that will make us safe or, or is looking at some of the broader threats that kind of face us all, like climate change, and kind of putting our funding and our skills to work against that, something that will make us safe. I think that's like, it's quite a powerful yeah. message to there's, take there's, out there's to people. There's quite a shocking statistic. Yeah. In the UK, we, we spend 30 times more towards the first in development of the arms trade than towards the first in development of uh, renewable energies. 30 times more, which kind of shows you where the priorities lie. And of course, it's a great example at the moment with Ebola in t terms of sort of being made safe. That actually they've got to put much more into health of poor countries because it's the health systems there which have led to the proliferation of the disease now. Mm. So, you know, that phrase, keeping us safe, there's an obvious avenue of doing it which isn't a military avenue. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. It gives us, I think it gives us a really good way to talk about the fact that militarisation makes us unsafe in some very important ways. Just say uh, that on one level, perhaps, um, having talked about the intermeshing and the, the well, links between the uh, owners of arms companies and the government, etc., in that actually the government often doesn't want us to feel safe. You know, the, the, the military industrial complex and the perpetual wars, the war on Cold War, the war on terror, the war on drugs, are ways of expanding control at home and funding the arms trade. Yeah, and the, the, the yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the media is and yeah, they're complicit, yeah, of course. I mean the I mean the Daily Mail was creating more scares in nineteen oh nine. Nothing's changed, yeah. yeah.